So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for coming to today's uh, CPET seminar. For those who don't know, CPET or the Caltech Project for Effective Teaching is a program dedicated to helping Caltech graduate students and postdocs improve their teaching skills and understanding of pedagogy by organizing seminars, facilitating discussion groups, and running certificate programs. Um, so we are excited to have Dr. Kelsey Metzger here with us today uh, to hear more and to hear more about pedagogical research. And so without further ado, I wanted to turn it over to Dr. Metzger. All right, well, thanks for having me today. As we get going, I'll just uh, reiterate to go ahead and say hi in the chat and I'll be uh, monitoring the chat and looking at hopefully some information about you guys. Um, let me get my chat window back front and center. So um, kind of the basis of the talk today is uh, introducing some of the ways that I've approached what I think of as scientific or scholarly teaching. Um, and so how do I know it works is this question that I find myself asking myself as an educator, basically for all of the choices that I make in the classroom. Um, you might have similar ponderings. And so kind of in the abstract for the talk I highlighted, this could be about student learning, a particular concept in your discipline. I'm a biologist, so you're gonna see lots of biology today. It could be about student attitudes. What are they thinking about? How do they perceive this? Or even about how they feel. So um, one of the projects I have is about science identity and kind of belonging in the STEM fields. Um, so our plan for today, outline-ish, I want this to be really informal and like I said, I want us to use this time how it works for you guys. You're here because hopefully you think this will be useful and so I want to uh, make sure that we can make the best of it, make the most of it. So I'll give you a bit about my background just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, tell you some adventures in evidence-based teaching. So some of the work that I have done or I'm in the midst of, um, and we'll do an audience choice to see where we wanna start. I've got three things queued up in the pipeline and we'll start where there's most interest. Um, and then questions and discussion along the way. So as I always tell my students, like I have an agenda, I can fill the time, but I would really like to take detours and spend time where we want to. So if we don't get through all three of my vignettes of research, that's totally fine. If we spend the whole time talking about one of them, that's absolutely fine with me. So I'm here for you guys. Okay, so my background, um, this is a picture of me as a master's student. So I'm from North Dakota originally. I, I did my undergraduate there. I'm a first generation college student. So I really didn't know how to play the college game. I didn't know graduate school was a thing. I didn't think about becoming a professor. Um, and all of that kind of changed as I first started getting my uh, research experiences as an undergraduate. I feel like I kind of lucked my way into these things, starting with a summer undergraduate research program. Um, and then continuing on, I fell in love with genetics. When I was sitting in my genetics class as an undergraduate, I was like, I think this is what I want to learn about forever and it was kind of my way of not choosing a discipline within biology because everything has genetics and so you can kind of transfer your knowledge to looking at any kind of context. Um, for my master's work I was looking at developmental biology and sex determination so lots of molecular genetics, lots of PCR and I learned that the true acronym is pipette cry repeat uh, but I did get to do a little bit of field work so here going out in the field to gather snapping turtle eggs as they're freshly laid these guys have temperature dependent sex determination so um, lots of of really fun stuff uh, and absolutely was sold that genetics was what I wanted to continue to study. And it was about that time that I was also being tasked with more teaching opportunities or being able to have more of a teaching role. And so I, uh, for example, got to run a one credit genetics recitation that was accompanied with the three credit lecture class. And I was like, yeah, sure, do whatever. And I kind of had these gut feelings about what was working. Uh, there were things that I got excited about. It seemed like the students were learning, but I really started to question how do I know that this is working? Um, and so it was sort of like, I'm doing all of this really rigorous lab work with statistical tests. I have all of this different kind of data, all these hypotheses, and I can make conclusions. I can say what worked and what didn't work with certainty. And so I really started to ask if I could approach my teaching in a similar way. And at that point, I began to look for doctoral programs that would allow me to, yes, continue to geek out in um, genetics. And in particular, I wanted to learn more bioinformatics stuff, uh, but also a program that would intentionally help me to become a better educator as well. So I found a program that fit the bill perfectly, the Doctor of Arts in Biology and Biology Education at Idaho State University. I won't say too much more about it other than it was absolutely perfect for me. Um, and so I finished my Doctor of Arts there in 2009. It's basically like a PhD in biology education. If you wanna think about that, the Doctor of Arts is a little bit uh, kind of an antiquated degree title. Um, and the research there was uh, my dissertation work focused on genetics and bioinformatics, like I had said, and then I also got to do all these supervised teaching internships and continue to um, question my assumptions about teaching. We tend to teach the way that we were taught, 
um, even if that's not always effective. And kind of the, the really difficult part about that is no matter where you are in your academic career, you've been pretty successful to get to this point. So even if you didn't experience the best teaching, it kind of worked for you. Um, and so this is a time when I was really questioning everything and you know, forming my teaching philosophy, getting to try stuff out, teaching in a range of classes and having expert teachers um, observe me and give me feedback, which was exactly what I was looking for. I started to learn about things like backward course design, where the backwards part is you start with the outcome, what you want students to know or to be able to do, and then everything kind of flows backward from that to your choice of course materials or your learning activities. Um, and I became familiar with the, uh, the triangle of teaching, so the alignment between your learning goals, uh, what you're actually doing with students and having them practice, and then how you're judging whether or not they were able to do what you set out to have them do. So those are a couple of my favorite resources. I was telling your hosts that I was uh, going to try to put together an annotated bibliography of all my favorite resources, but there's a few sprinkled throughout the talk and you can always hit me up for um, more information. But these are two things that I find myself referring to a lot. Um, and it was also this time when um, active learning started to become this vogue word. And so there hadn't yet been this big revolution where people um, called for more active and student centered approaches to teaching. It was just starting, uh, but by far and large, everybody was cool with the traditional dissemination model. You got the sage on the stage, the expert tells everybody everything else, students succeed or they don't, whatever, right? Um, and so I love this figure. Um, for Project Kaleidoscope uh, that just looks at how you can elevate the role of the learners in the classroom as active participants. And that can be any number of an engagement strategy. So I'll, I'll, this one definitely would have gone on my annotated bibliography if you are interested in how can I shake my classroom up. It's the CATS book. So classroom assessment techniques. This is like, that's a good one. Um, yeah, so these are just kind of things that fed into how I was thinking as a, a finishing up that Pearl student and I started looking at where I would go in the world and what kind of a position I wanted in academics. Um, and I kind of held on to this it came from the Ken Bain book, um, where basically you can boil down my teaching philosophy to wanting to help students make a sustained, substantial and positive influence um, on how they think, feel and act. So we're going to come back to this idea of how students think, feel, and act in my um, research stories. So how do you measure this stuff? Okay, I think something that I'm doing is working. How can I actually turn that into a research question? Um, so really briefly, right now I'm at University of Minnesota Rochester, which is this uh, really small startup campus. It's only about 10 years old. Our first freshman cohort came in in 2009, which is right when I was finishing my doctoral study. So um, the mission of this campus belongs to the system. Uh, sometimes people don't even remember that we exist, but we're uh, down at the southeast tip of the state. And uh, yes, we have a mascot, no sports teams, but we have a mascot, it's an angry chicken. Go Raptors. Um, and our mission is uh, to inspire transformation in higher education through innovations um, and helping students solve grand health challenges. So all this really lofty stuff, which means we're trying to use all these high impact practices. And we got to start from scratch and design this degree program, um, mostly without the trappings of institutional momentum or inertia to take all the things that we're starting to learn about what works in higher education and abandon the stuff that doesn't work. So my last, uh, what, 10, 12 years has been this journey of trying things out, shaking things up, um, and seeing what we can learn about it. Um, some more stuff about high impact practices. The classrooms that I teach in are intentionally active learning classrooms um, or scale up classrooms or student centered classrooms. There's a whole body of literature about the design of classrooms and how big the table should be and where you should put them and what kind of technology you need. Um, basically, you can do active learning anywhere, but this is the space. This is a, um, the largest classroom that I teach in, which seats 70. Most of our classrooms are a smaller version that seat about 42. Uh, so these places tend to get very busy and very loud. These are just some snaps. Um, I love getting students up and out of their seats. I think kinesthetic is really important. Yes, they all have laptops. Yes, I use paper handouts, all that stuff. But if I can use magnets, if I can use the whiteboards, if I can have them acting things out, everything is fair game. Um, if we have time later, ask me about trail mix. 
Uh, we also have these drop-in tutoring centers. So we're really, really big on relationships. And so instead of having students come and find us in our offices, which can be really intimidating, may be really difficult to find us, uh, there's a huge activation barrier. We have these intentionally placed, uh, just ask tutoring centers, uh, staff by faculty from all disciplines and students just walk by us, right? As they're leaving class to like, oh, hey, I did have a chemistry question or, oh, hey, can you look at my paper? So uh, we're in their common space. We see them, they see us us and we're uh, really trying to, to build relationships um, and increase interaction. So the high touch faculty model. Okay, so back to my questions. Um, this is the world in which I live. These are the questions that I'm asking. Um, now I'm going to let you guys pick our first adventure. Uh, we have a story about how students think. So this is a uh, biology knowledge research question where I did some pre post testing and something in the middle. Um, how students act. So I got really into um, unpacking assessment experiences with students and thinking about how they study and how they think about their thinking. So metacognition. Um, adventure three is how students feel. So science identity and stereotype threat and things like that. So I don't have any like Jeopardy music or whatever, but I think we got a Zoom poll for this. Is that one, two, and three? Okay, cool. So um, almost everybody voted again. I'll just show you guys so that I'm not uh, I'm not rigging the vote or anything like that. Complete transparency in this democratic process. So we've got uh, most votes for option number two. So we'll start with the student metacognition and go from there. Okay. So I know you guys already have all the slides. So you know, spoiler alert. Dig ahead at your own peril. So I'm going to skip down to adventure number two, changing how students act. And I'm going to actually pause here for a moment and see if anybody has any questions about kind of my background or any of the buzzwords I used. Um, I have a question. Yes, Susie. Uh, thanks. Um, also, I see there's one in the chat, but I just got it. it. So, um, I saw that there were only two majors offered at your university. So what yeah. are they? <laughs> yeah, so we are in the heart of Med City. Rochester, Minnesota is the home of the Mayo Clinic. And so since we belong to this huge system, University of Minnesota offers every degree imaginable. And our mothership campus in the Twin Cities is just 70 miles up the road from me. And so when the system was considering to build another campus here, they were like, we're not going to replicate everything that's up the road in the Twin Cities, right? We're not going to, it doesn't make any sense. So our whole reason for being was to focus on health sciences and to have community-based partnerships and be on the cutting edge and innovation and blah, blah, blah. So our two degrees are a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences, BSHS, and um, a Bachelor of Science in Health Professions, BSHP. Um, now, the program that I'm primarily involved with is a BSHS, which is your traditional four-year undergraduate um, degree. Um, and then the HP is actually a junior admitting program that's in partnership with the Mayo Clinic. And so uh, if students are selected to be in that pathway, they end up following one of uh, various health professions tracks like sonography, radiation, um, nuclear medicine, yada, yada, yada. And then when they graduate, they get the four-year degree plus the certificate from the professional program. So um, once those students are accepted into that junior admit program, they go on the Mayo Clinic, they're trained by people in that, that pro professional area. And I don't see them until graduation again, but um, yeah. So those are our two programs. Okay, and then pre-post. So when I'm talking about assessing change, usually I'll want to see where my students are coming in. So I'll do like a pre-course assessment. And there's like many, many flavors of those. Those can be anything from an entire instrument where you've got these quantitative questions or um, maybe it's assessment. So you're doing a biology concept assessment to see how they score on particular knowledge. And then you, you do whatever in the middle, right? So I teach my course or I do my intervention or whatever. And then at the end of the course, I do a post assessment. And so I wanna see if from pre to post, there's been any change, whether that's, did they learn something? Did they change their thinking about something? Um, and that helps me know if what I did, did anything, or at least in part, right? There's no perfect assessment. Okay, 
Uh, so I have another audience participation in the chat for you guys. We're going to talk about um, exams and assessment cycles and things like that. And so one of the things as a young faculty member that I was really disheartened by was when a student would come into my, well, actually, I'm going to can the example. In the chat, do you guys think that if students, I'm talking about undergraduate students at this point, pretty introductory level students, if you ask them to predict their exam score, say they take an exam and they're walking out the classroom and you're like, hey, what do you think you got on that exam? If you ask them to predict their exam score, how do you think their, their prediction would stack up to real life? Oh, interesting. So you had a variety of responses. Some say they're gonna over predict their score. A lot of you are saying that they're gonna under predict their score. It depends on student identity. It depends on what's going on. Okay, yeah, I think there's some truth in all of that. Um, my story is that as a young faculty member, I would get students coming into my office after an exam and they'd be like, I studied so hard and I took the exam and I thought I got an A, but actually I got a C. And as a faculty member, I was like, wow, that's really disturbing. Like, how can a student have not a good sense of how they actually perform? Like, you take the exam, you should have a pretty good idea if you got stuff wrong or right, right? Um, and so I wanted to see if this was a widespread phenomenon that students don't accurately gauge their performance. And I found um, that, in fact, students don't have great accuracy. And this is from my, my first year biology class that's required in the major. And so this is students in rank order of their earned exam score from lowest to highest along the X and then along the Y is their actual score. So um, my students who earned a 40%, let's say, oh, I think I've got a, let me see if I can get my annotate thing working. There we go. So hopefully, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse here. Awesome. So a student who earned a 40% walked out of the exam and said, I think I got a 70 on that exam. Um, and so you can see this really large gap, particularly in the lower performing students. And then you get to this point, uh, maybe around where students are earning uh, an 80% or so, and you do start to see that under prediction. And so some of my high performing students are really under predicting. And again, there's a ceiling, right? You can only get as much as 100% on an exam. So there is part of that effect going on. Um, but what I was most concerned about was this gap. And if you've heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, there's a little bit of that going on here where somebody who is really novice and just doesn't know um, they don't know what they don't know. So there's this whole body of research about that. Um, and so I looked at across exams and just a little orientation to this graph. So my top performing students, my middle performing students, and my low performing students um, broken out on overall course grade. So if uh, you're a top performing student, you are tending to underestimate your performance. And if you are a middle performing student, you uh, tend to overestimate performance. And if you are a low performing student, you tend to drastically overestimate your performance. So uh, Dunning-Kruger kind of born out there. My lower performing students are having the least amount of kind of self-awareness, self-regulation. So this was... Um, uh, the way that I got this data was literally the last question on their exam. I would ask, what do you anticipate? Now that you've finished this exam, what do you anticipate your score will be? And so I got that. Um, I also did this as a collaboration with another institution. So right, my institution is unique. I have a particular population. Does this trend hold at other institutions? So this was at Mankato, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota State University, Mankato, and a colleague looked in her undergraduate uh, intro bio and found the same thing. Top performers tend to underestimate, whereas middle and low performers um, tend to overestimate. Middles are kind of interesting. Okay, so I wanted students to think about this inability in some cases to accurately predict what their performance was, because knowing where you are informs what you need to do to get to the score that you want, right? Students have a definite idea of where they want to go in the course, what they want to see on that transcript. But what we need is to help them get to that point. And that very first step is recognition. So I wanted students to engage in reflective practices, but you can't just ask students to do something and expect them to do it unless you make it valuable to them. Right, students like us, they're super busy. They have a ton of demands on their time. So if it doesn't show up as something valuable to them, and that means worth course credit, they're not gonna do it. 
Um, so I came up with this uh, iterative cycle to help students engage in metacognition. Um, and so we would do right our unit instruction, they would take an exam, and then they would do this post exam prediction like I talked about. Um, then I developed a series of instruments, it's called a student metacognition and study habits instrument and it's out there in literature, you can uh, find all the items. Um, and so I had them ask, answer these questions about, well, how did you prepare for the exam? How many times did you ask questions to the instructor? Did you prepare by yourself or with peers? Did you use the learning uh, materials like the course objectives or the, the supplementary problems, all that kind of stuff. So just getting them to think about what they had actually done to prepare. Then they would get their exam score returns. This is usually a, a day or two lag um, to make sure I could get this reflection stuff. And then once they got the exam scores, I wanted them to not just crumple it up and throw it away. I wanted them to look at what they had done on the exam and figure out what they may have gotten wrong and why. So I would have them go through the series of questions. Are you surprised by your earned score? Why or why not? Um, look through the items you missed. Do you think that there's a pattern? Is it a particular type of question? Is it a particular concept? What was it that, that you missed? And then make corrections for all the items that you missed. Tell me what the right answer is and why. So we would do this and I played with the number of, of units from four to six. Um, and so I would have students do this just as an iterative cycle throughout the semester. And what I like to point out is that these behaviors, this um, thinking about your performance, thinking about how you prepared, finding what errors you made, these are the kind of expert behaviors that we want students to engage in, but they don't know that's what we want them to do. Right? Unless they had really good preparation or they had a, a study habits class or they had an older sibling who sat them down and said, this is how you need to succeed in college, whatever it is. Maybe they had a really great first year seminar. I'm not sure. But I would say by far and large, students don't know that these are the kind of behaviors that we want them to engage in to be successful. We just expect them to know that. So by taking these things and assigning them credit in the course, these things are all worth points. You get points for doing the reflection, you get points for doing the corrections, right? I'm putting value in student terms to behaviors that I want them to exhibit. Okay, so on all of these places, you can read more about this in the paper. I can give you the link if I don't have it linked in here. I got data to see what students were telling me about how they were performing, about their anticipation, about if they were surprised or not. Um, I got to look at all sorts of things that could help me understand the cycle and who was engaging in it and who wasn't, all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, here's the link to the couple of papers that are there. So you can read all the fun stuff about instrument development and how we use this. Um, and the really great part about this tool, my favorite thing is that it's not discipline specific. So any course in which there's some sort of summative assessment, you can use this. Um, it uh, is totally like mix and match. So if there are particular questions on the instrument that you want to use and others that you don't, cool. If you just want students to think about their performance, you can have them do that gut check. What do you think you got before they see their score and just have that as an opportunity for reflection. Um, or you can, you know, like I said mix and match whatever you want with it. Um, and it's just embedded in the normal uh, cycle of the course. So this could very easily fit into any course that has those sorts of summative assessments. Um, I have more data here that are from the papers, so I won't spend too much time on them. Um, but I asked students about their study habits overall and how they're thinking about their study habits. Uh, do you think your study habits are effective? Um, are they... Uh, are they helping you to plan to adjust your study habits? Right now, I've got a lot of data about if you say you want to change your study habits, do you feel you have the resources you need to do so? Because it's totally a different story to say I want to change versus I can change. Um, so there's there's just tons of data that, that comes out of those um, instruments, depending on what you're interested in. Um, for me, just one really quick uh, snapshot, right? I wanted to know if I was changing the way that students acted. And I'm not video recording them or doing study logs or anything like that, which could be ways to answer this question um, in less of a self-report way, but just asking students at the end of the class, my study habits have changed as a result of this class. You can see that the vast, vast, vast majority of my students say, yes, my study habits changed. Um, and then I have a qualitative follow-up question that asks, if your study habits have changed, tell me why. And so I have a lot of information about what students say they needed to do to, to meet their study goal or their, their performance goals usually is what it is. Like, I didn't realize I had to practice before I took the exam and stuff like that. 
Um, so some other things I talked about uh, putting uh, things you value into student currency. And so this isn't uh, about the assessment part, but sort of like the overall flow of the unit. Anything that you want students to spend time on, I would say one of the takeaways is to put course points on it. So if you're an instructor who says, read the chapter and do the practice problems before you come to class, and that doesn't show up in the grade book, good luck with that. So um, for my classes, and this is especially important with the remote and online and asynchronous stuff too, you have to chunk it out for the students and show them exactly where you want them to engage and have points associated with everything. So I do a pre-class entry ticket. So they do this uh, thing before class, some low stakes stuff so that they're familiar with the material before they come in. We do active learning, collaborative stuff, what have you. And then at the end of the class, I also have an exit ticket. So now that you've come to class, I want you to show me that you have a better handle on this uh, stuff that we practiced in class. So a direct line between prepare, practice, um, evaluate, low stakes, multiple attempts, all that stuff. Um, and then also building in places for them to check their knowledge with other people, because it's one thing to kind of check yourself, but students also need to have uh, a broader perspective of, can I explain this to a peer? Is how a peer is understanding this, uh, you know, in line with how I'm thinking about it. It also provides that sense of belonging and support that students so desperately needed in our asynchronous and online world. So I implemented also weekly team wrap up, um, more practice that students did together as teams. So any one of those could be a full hour long research talk, but if you want students to do it, throw points at it. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and look what we've got in the chat. Um, so chronological exams, I'm gonna ask for follow up for that question. So in my um, diagram, I think is when that question popped up. So like I said, I, I usually have about four units per a 16 week semester. And so we would have a particular unit and then they would have their exam and yada, yada, yada. They'd have about a week to go through this reflection cycle. And then we'd start the next unit, go through instruction for three, four weeks. I don't know if that answers chronological. I think the chronological question was earlier when you posted data of exams one through six. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. And then what would happen if the SMASH instrument was administered before the post-exam prediction? I don't know. Um, so if I asked students to be mindful about the ways in which they had prepared, how early they had started studying, things like that, maybe they would be a little bit more possibly accurate. I don't think so though. I don't think it's until they see their exam score reality that they're like oh maybe i didn't actually study as much as i thought i did so we have this little um code word at umr and we, it's it's the honest hour and so especially when students are griping that they spent a ton of time griping isn't a nice word students are feeling um I don't know, like they spent two, they're not getting the return on investment that they want. That's maybe a nicer way of saying it. Uh, and it's like, okay, you spent three hours studying. Was that with the TV on in the background? Did you have Netflix going? Were you chatting at the same time? And you don't like accuse them in this way. It's just like, oh, tell me what you mean by studying for three hours. What did that look like? And then they start explaining it and they're like, oh, actually, yeah. And I took a break to do this. And I went for a walk and actually, no, I wasn't actually studying for three hours. So an honest hour, um, you know, like really dedicated focused studying time. So I don't know. I don't think that answered the question. I think I went on a tangent. I'm not sure what would happen. You can try it and let me know. Okay, um, there's also a really good paper. Um, I think it's Eddie and Hogan from 2014. Um, and it's called Getting Under the Hood. Uh, for whom and why does increased course structure work? And that's one of my favorite ones for thinking about when you add in basically more structure to your course, think about the, the least amount of structure being like, we're covering chapters one through five and then you have an exam. It's very little structure for students. And with something like what I'm showing here, you have all of these kind of distributed assignments, lower stakes assessments, all of these different check-in points. Um, that increased structure has been shown to benefit all students, but most, uh, most significantly underrepresented students, historically marginalized students, first generation students, um, individuals like that. So um, yeah, really great work. I can find that link if you like. Okay, I'm gonna pause for, mm. so is this approach better suited to first year or every year? 
So I use this in both my first year class and also my upper division genetics class. Um, I do streamline it a little bit for the genetics class because the students have seen this before. They're more experienced students. They know where I'm going with this, but I keep especially the exam corrections bit. And I've had students repeatedly tell me, actually thank me and say, I know I should be doing this, right? Courses are generally cumulative. So if you miss it on exam one, it's gonna come back to bite you later. Um, and so they thank me for making it worth their while to do this work that they know they should be doing. Like, I know this is really great, but if I didn't have it as an assignment that I had to do it, I wouldn't do it. So I definitely think the corrections is really good. Um, I still do have them do the prediction thing just so that they're keeping an eye on, you know, how am I thinking about my learning and my performance? Um, yeah, and the students in my program are very used to me checking in with them and asking for feedback, you know, mid semester feedback, what are you doing that's working, what am I doing that's working, what could we maybe change up. Um, and so I think that they're they're used to this back and forth and again, the picture that I showed you of how the classroom is this uh, very connected learning community with all these inputs and all these outputs kind of working together it's this Rube Goldberg machine much more so than that um, you know instructor giving the one-way transmission of information so I think students know the more information they give me and the more we can have a dialogue about the choices I'm making in the classroom and how it impacts them the better off we end up okay and we've got the Eddie and Hogan paper in the chat thanks for that I'm with my people. That's great. Okay, so we've got about 20 minutes. And um, this was the second most highly rated topic you guys wanted to hear about. And I think it's really timely and a really great story. So I'll look through this and I'll tell you guys up front that I am I am like chin deep in data analysis on this paper. I'm putting together the manuscript. Um, and I'm really excited about where the data is going. So it's not, I haven't quite wrapped it up and tied a bow on it, but I, this is a pretty good story that I'm gonna tell you. So about um, five years ago, I saw a talk at uh, SABER, so Society for Advancement of Biology Education Research, and it was this talk about science stereotypes and how if you ask somebody to picture a scientist, they will immediately conjure up this image. And I have one suggested here. Thank you, Google Images. And we know that um, our classrooms are very diverse. They're becoming increasingly diverse and um, that identities matter. And so what students see for examples of role models in their textbooks or the um, the literature that we're using in our classrooms, the people who are in front of them in the classroom, all of these things matter. So I have a couple slides here about, you know, we know all of these things. There's not equity um, and our choices as educators, this is really what I'm gonna try to sell you on. Our choices matter, they make a big difference. And so um, there's this approach that I wanna talk about using counter stereotypical examples of scientists in the classroom. Um, and I'm going to argue that it is a really easy and effective part of how you can be an anti-racist educator and support a diverse student body because that's really what we want we want to help all students succeed and have um, greater representation you know further along down the line as graduate students as postdocs as faculty as pis all of that so really small practice i think can have big results and i'll show you the data why okay so i saw this talk and it was about scientists stereotypes and this instructor Jeff Shinsky at a community college had implemented scientist spotlight assignments and they would spotlight a particular scientist um, and he did this in a 10-week course and he did one assignment for every week so 10 assignments and I sat in the audience at Sabre and I was like this is really great uh, I'd love to do this but my class is already full right you guys have seen some of the stuff that I do I require a lot of students can I maybe just dip my toe in the water on this? And is that gonna be useful or is it just not worth it? Um, so I decided that I was going to try these scientist spotlight assignments. I was going to use fewer of them and I was going to measure to see if it made a difference. Okay, so I've already given you a bit of the background. I won't go through the specific research questions because you guys have got them there, but basically I wanted to know if this makes a difference. And so I was asking students at the beginning and the uh, end of the course um, to describe the types of people who do science and if possible to name a particular scientist. And I also asked them to the extent that they agreed with, I know of one or more important scientists to whom I can personally relate. And then I asked them to explain why they rated the way that they did. So I did these at the beginning of the semester and I did these at the end of the semester. And this was following the model of the original research that had already been published, that they got a significant 
positive increase when they did this 10 times, the assignments 10 times throughout the semester and asked these questions before and after. Okay, so more audience participation. Um, I would like to know, and I'm gonna ask you about subpopulation. So just to let you know, I was very interested in, um, did this, does performance have anything to do about this? So higher performing, lower performing, et cetera. Does this have any difference in gender, ethnicity, students of color, first-gen students, Pell eligible students? Okay, so here's my question for you guys, audience response time. Do you guys think, ask me to predict, if I did four scientist spotlight assignments, did the students self-reported relatability, the extent to which they could relate to a scientist, did that change in my pre to post? Um, did, and did you pick the spotlights or were they allowed to pick? I picked, so I purposely chose individuals that I wanted my students to see. So I took a little bit about what I knew about my student population and I gave them examples um, that weren't dead white guys. And then um, do you think that the different subpopulations were affected in similar or different ways? And be as specific as you can in your predictions. So did relatability change? And um, same or different. And I'll put back up my demographic variables. There you go. Okay. And as you guys are thinking about that, so research questions, did a student's perspective, did the student's perspectives change? Um, so that's the quantitative, the Likert scale one to five. Um, if yes, in what ways? So that's the qualitative open response thing. Um, are students' perspectives correlated with demographic or performance variables? So among my subpopulations, are there differences? And then the way in which students describe who does science, does that change the way they're describing scientists? So um, this was, Four years of data, uh, my undergraduate health sciences students, 77% female, 31% um, student of color, and at least 36% first generation. I've got some missing data on that variable, but at least 36% first generation. This is my 16 week uh, first year biology class. And for two years, I did four scientist spotlight assignments. Um, based on some initial data, I decided to up it to six scientist spotlights. So I've got two years um, with each treatment. Okay, and a total population of 427 students. Okay, I'm gonna cut to the chase so we can discuss. Um, there was a difference in every single year, whether there were four or six assignments, my scale, my five point scale shifts about one point to the more positive direction. So if a student had initially said um, somewhat disagree, they would shift one place to agree. Or if they started at agree, they would shift to strongly agree. So an average of one point shift every single year. Now, the really compelling part to me about this is that is exactly the same shift that the Shinsky paper reported with 10 assignments. So they did 10 assignments, got a one point shift on average. I did four, you guys, four assignments and I got the same magnitude of an improvement. That's huge. Okay, um, so yes, we get a huge shift. Uh, what ways do students' descriptions change? You guys have these slides, so I'm not gonna read these all to you, um, but maybe I'll cherry pick a couple here. So at the beginning, for example, this student says, I'm unsure whether there are any important scientists can I relate to, I don't really know. Um, at the end, she's talking about, as a woman, I related to Claire and um, this empowers female scientists. Um, and so I saw some really interesting themes with students talking about different pieces of their identity that they then saw in the scientists who were highlighted. Um, so this female student talks also about relating to the women of color. Now, did this change positively benefit all students? It seems to be yes. So uh, my white male student was not necessarily picking up on a demographic thing. So he wasn't talking about um, ethnicity or gender, but he was talking about uh, kind of these personality attributes. So at the beginning, he's like, oh, I don't really know how I'm supposed to relate to a scientist. And at the end, he's like, you know, these scientists people had to endure through hardship and they were criticized and that helps me to power through. So different students found different bits of the scientist spotlights that spoke to them. Okay, I'm going to skip that stuff and go to the um, 
the demographic variables. This is hot off the presses. I'm so excited about this stuff. So we did uh, multiple regression models, fit the data in all sorts of ways. And um, we looked at pre and post. So coming in, I did not expect these results. I expected some other groups maybe to pop out as being more impacted, but first generation students stole the show. They come in at least half a point under, so they are relating to scientists less than my continuing ed students. But by the time they leave, they are indistinguishable from continuing gen students and their ability to relate to scientists. That's huge. Um, and at the end, uh, both my male and my female students uh, increased with their sense of relatability, but female students more so. So at the end of the course, um, males end up having a slightly lower relatability relative to female identifying students. So that's pretty interesting. Um, what else? Oh, okay, so just some from the qualitative data, SCADs and SCADs of qualitative data, uh, as you would probably predict at the incoming point, students are uh, talking about uh, very, very stereotypical scientists. There's lists in case you're curious of what we consider to be stereotypical scientists, although I think it needs revision. It's a little outdated. Um, and they talk about scientists in these very stereotypical ways. They're totally nerdy. They have horrible social skills, uh, but they are super genius, smart, motivated. So both positive stereotypes and negative stereotypes. Um, the top three by far, every single semester, Darwin, Einstein, Newton, in that order. Um, and at the beginning of the semester, they were really fond of making lists. Remember, I asked them to name a specific scientist, and there were so many students who just said, oh, biologists are scientists, physicists are scientists, uh, pharmacists are scientists, astrologers are scientists, like all of these different astrologer, astronomers, let's get our sciences right. Um, and at the end of the semester, they don't really do that anymore. Um, so I coded all this data. I had a colleague code it with me so we could do some inter-rater reliability. Um, and this is kind of this, a huge amount of data summarized here, but this is showing you change in frequency. So I was just talking about those laundry lists of fields of science. So at the beginning of the term, um, students talked a ton about field of science and it decreased uh, almost 30%. Um, so this frequency of just listing uh, fields of science totally decreased. Um, the theme, different kinds of people do science, uh, increased by 25-ish percent, um, and listing a stereotypical scientist decreased a ton, and then naming a non-stereotypical scientist raised a lot. So I think at the end of term, only 2% of students are listing a stereotypical scientist. There was no more Darwin, Einstein, Newton in the post. Um, and they said really cool stuff like, hey, normal people do science. Everyone does science. Okay, um, so so pre-descriptions included more well-known white guys, dead white guys, and those were fewer in number, mostly listed scientists who had been featured in the spotlight. Um, and the pre-descriptions tended to be more um, impersonal, whereas the post-descriptions tended to be uh, more humanizing and more diverse. So um, pre, they'd say things like, oh, person wearing blue scrubs, a white lab coat, um, and exclusivity. So science is something not everyone can go into. Uh, you had to be really smart intellectually, but maybe you don't have the best social skills. And post, they said stuff like, uh, scientists can be people from any gender, ethnicity, upbringing, some even with a sense of humor. Um, anyone can do science. I like learning about the underrepresented groups of women and people of color. So uh, more of that. Um, and generally, I would say, hopefully this data and the paper that's coming out hopefully soon uh, will convince you that this had a really positive impact on students. And again, it's not like the magic silver bullet solve all the problems in, in higher ed, um, but it's it's something and it's really easy, low hanging fruit. There's an online repository I linked at the beginning, scientistspotlights.org, hundreds of scientists. You can pick whichever ones you want. You can have scientists pick. The assignments are already written easy peasy. Thank you again, Dr. Mesker, for your wonderful, instructive and active talk. Um, and so we're going to let everyone go. But we, before everyone goes, <laughs> uh, we wanted to let everyone know that we will also be putting out a call for applications for the position of CPET co-director. Uh, so if you think you'd be interested in helping lead the Caltech project for effective teaching, uh, keep an eye out in the next few weeks uh, for, for that call for applications. Well, if you have any follow-up questions or if anybody wants more information, um, I'd be happy to see an email from you in my inbox. So.